only suckers put hope in the future. You see, I tell you, there are three classes of people in the Western world. The aristocrats, the proletariat, and the bourgeoisie. The aristocrats live on the past because they come of noble family. And they're like potatoes because the best part of them is underground. <laughs> the proletariat live in the present because they have nothing else. And the poor bourgeoisie live for the future. They are the eternal suckers. They can always open to a con game. So when they find out that really uh, th there isn't much of a future, you're going to die, they transpose the future into a spiritual dimension. And they figure uh, this material world is not the real world, uh, but the, the spiritual world is the real world. And there will be somewhere, somehow, an eternal life for me. A charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, a never dying soul to save and fit it for the sky. Well, then they say to them, what are you going to do there? Well, they have the faintest idea. You know that? If you ask theologians about what they think is going to happen in heaven, they just dry up. Oh, we're going to play harps. I mean, there's a symbolic meaning to that which I could go into, but the average person's idea of heaven is an absolute bore. I mean, it's like being in church forever. And children see this immediately. Children, when they hear a hymn like, Weary of earth and laden with my sin, I looked at heaven and longed to enter in. They think, oh God. <laughs> heaven is to be in church for always. And they think hell is preferable. There's at least some excitement going on. And you see it in medieval art. You take, you go to the Metropolitan Museum in New York and you see Jan van Eyck's painting of the Last Judgment. Heaven on top, hell below. In heaven, everybody's looking as that, like the cat that swallowed the canary, sitting in rows and very smug. God the Father is president and, uh, oh dear. Beneath this, there's a winged skull, like a bat and squirming bodies, all nude, all being eaten by snakes, and I don't know, is a fantastic thing going on. But in that, you see, Van Eyck had a ball painting that. Because in, in, in medieval way, it was the only way you could get away with painting nudes. And sexy scenes, sadomasochistic, see? So that's naturally why hell became much more interesting than heaven. <laughs> so, therefore, this hope for the future is a hoax. It's a perfect hoax. And maybe we, we will make spiritual progress. Everybody puts it off. Maybe if I work at yoga for 10 years, 20 years, and uh, do, do this thing, I will eventually make it to moksha, to nirvana, whatever. That's nothing more than a postponement. It's this business of, because you're not fully alive now, you think maybe someday you will be. Look, supposing I ask you, what did you do yesterday? No, what did I do yesterday? I've, in fact, I've forgotten. So, but most people will say, well, let me see now. Let me get out my notebook. I got up at uh, 7.30 and I brushed my teeth and I read the newspaper over a cup of coffee and then I looked at the clock and dressed and uh, got in the car and drove downtown and did this and that in the office and so on and you go on and on and on and you suddenly discover that what you've described has absolutely nothing to do with what happened. You've described a scraggly, skeletal, fleshless list of abstractions. Whereas if you were actually aware of what went on, you could never describe it. Because nature is multidimensional. Language is linear. Language is scrawny. 
And therefore, if you identify the world as it is with the way the world is described, it's as if you were trying to eat dollar bills and expect a nutritious diet or eat numbers. A lot of people eat numbers. People play the stock market. They're doing nothing but eating numbers. And they're always unhappy, absolutely miserable. Because they never get anything. So therefore, they always hope more is coming. Because they believe that if they eat enough dollar bills, eventually something satisfactory will happen. So eating the abstractions all the time, we want more, more, more time. Confucius very wisely said, a man who understands the Tao in the morning may die with content in the evening. Because when you understand, you don't put your hope in time. Time won't solve a thing. So when we enter into the, the, the practice of meditation, of yoga, we are doing something radically unlike other human activities. Of course, the way yoga is sold in the United States, like everything else, is that it's supposed to be good for you. It isn't. It has nothing to do with anything that's good for you. It's the one activity which you do for its own sake, and not because it's good for you, not because it will lead anywhere, because you cannot go to the place where you are now, obviously. Yoga is to be completely here and now. That's why the word yog means join. Get with it. Be completely here and now. This is the real meaning of concentration, to be in your center. And the Christian word for sinning in Greek is amatanin, which means to miss the point. And the point is eternal life, which is here and now. Come to your senses. <laughs> so yoga is defined in Sanskrit. <coughs> in the Yoga Sutra, Yoga Sthita Vritti Nirodha. Difficult to translate, but roughly, yoga is the stopping of... Vritti uh, is turning, see, like a wheel. And Chitta is consciousness. Turnings in consciousness. In other words, the attempt of the mind to catch hold of itself, which is what we call thinking, worrying. So we could say loosely, yoga is the cessation of thinking. It's not the cessation of awareness, but of symbolizing, trying to catch reality in terms of thoughts, symbols, descriptions, definitions. Give it up. It's not easy because we do it habitually. But until there is silence of the mind, it is almost impossible to understand eternal life, that is to say, eternal now.